We now have the time for the question and answer session. To derive maximum benefit from the program, which is Ask Dr. Zakir, we will have some strict guidelines regarding the question and answer session. First of all, please kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. If you do wish to ask a second question, you'll have a chance to go to the back of the row and await your chance to ask the second question. If there are any non-Muslim brothers or sisters, they will be given first preference to ask the questions. So contact one of the volunteers and they will put you to the front of the line. We have three mics available in the auditorium. One to my left for the brothers, one in the center of the auditorium, and one in the back for the sisters. Lastly, we kindly request that you state your name and your profession before putting forth your question. So once we're ready, we will have the first question from the front mic from the brothers. Good evening to everyone. I am a security guard by profession from uh, Central Africa, Cameroon. I have been leading people to go to the washroom and to go to the prayer room also. And then this little boy, he came and I led him to the washroom. And he now said he wants to discuss something with me. When I opened up to him, he tried to convince me to, to become a Muslim. That is good for me. And I asked him... <laughs> and I asked him, why do you think it's good for me? He said uh, that I should try it, I will never regret. And I told him I have uh, listened to the speakers. I'm highly convinced that uh, Islam is the best religion. So I want to, I want to become a Muslim. MashaAllah. The brother was asked by our young Muslim, and that gives an example, mashallah, that age is never a barrier. And I know that more than 50% of you may not have spoken to a non-Muslim, and this young boy, I think his age may be six years, seven years? 12 years, mashallah. 12 years, not even in his teens, has convinced our brother here, mashallah, from Cameron. Brother, are you accepting Islam out of your free will? Do you want to accept Islam out of your free will? Yes, sir. Is anyone forcing you? No, 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 no one is forcing me, sir. MashaAllah. It's out of free will. Do you believe that there is one God? Yes, there's only one God, sir. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger? Yes. Inshallah. So I'll just say in Arabic and you can repeat that, Inshallah. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu wa rasuluhu wa rasul I bear witness I bear witness that that there is no god there is no god but Allah but Allah and and prophet Muhammad prophet Muhammad is is his messenger and servant his messenger and servant and servant mashallah mashallah you are a muslim mashallah <laughs> may Allah reward you and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide you and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he grant you jannah and I pray also that may that youngster, mashallah. And I request the brothers that whenever you meet a new Muslim, be kind to him, be patient with him, and whatever help they require, inshallah. And there are many organizations here in Dubai. If you require any information regarding Islam, you're most welcome to contact them. We'll have the next question from the sister's mic. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, there's a sister here who was convinced and she also wants to make her shahada. <laughs> Mashallah, I thought it was a question answer session and turned into a shahada session. Yes. Sister, what's your name? My name is Eddie from Philippines. Are you convinced about Islam, sister? Yes, I am. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam or it's of a free will? No, it's my free will. Do you believe there is one God? Yes, I do believe. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God? 
Yes, I do believe. Inshallah, I'll say in Arabic and you can repeat, sister. Inshallah. Ashadu. I should do. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. That. That. There is no God. There is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad. Is. Is. The messenger. The messenger. And servant of Allah. And. The servant of Allah. The servant of Allah. Mashallah. Sister. You have become a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That may he grant you Jannah. And if you have any queries. Any question about Islam. You are most free to ask the local organization. Or you can go to our website. www.irf.net And surely. You can contact the local people here. For having more knowledge of Islam. You can read the books. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you and to grant you Jannah. Congratulations, sister. We'll have the next question from the brothers Mark in the center. My name is Rajesh. I work for an IT company. First, I would like to say, Assalamu alaikum. Sir, you're a versatile personality and you have knowledge of all the religion. And always you have said, there's one and only Allah. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last messenger with the references and help of Hindu books. So now my question is, what about millions and billions of Hindus, Sikhs, Jain, Buddhists, they are praying at? Does their structure exist or there is only Allah and the Allah? Thank you. The brother asked a very important question. He says that he has heard my talk and I speak for different religions and I try and prove that there is only one Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger. Not only from the Quran, from the Hindu scriptures, from the Christian scriptures. So the question is, what about the millions and billions of non-Muslims, the Hindus, the Christians, that their structure yet exists? As far as the structure existing, if you go to the scriptures, all the scriptures that came before the Quran, in the passage of time, they have been manipulated, there has been corruption, there has been concoction. Therefore, if you apply the rule of logic and science, no scripture will pass the test except the Quran. But the beauty of all this is, that even though the scriptures of the other religions have been changed, whether it be the Vedas, whether it be Ramayana, whether it be Mahabharat, whether it be Bhagavad Gita, whether it be the Bible, whether it be Dhammapad, what we realize that even in the changed form, even in the corrupted form, there are remnants, there are many verses which speak about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Tawheed. Even though the scriptures have got corrupted, there are parts which yet say that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. So what I say, that if they do research, and if they really want to be a good Christian, as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself, all that dear shall he say. He shall guide you to truth. He shall glorify me. So here Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is telling his followers that there is a messenger to come, Prophet Muhammad. If I give you the message now, you will not be able to grasp it. When he comes, he will guide you to all truth. So if a Christian has to be a true Christian, he has to follow the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same thing with the Hindus. There are many references of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam besides Tawheed. It talks about the Kalki Autar, the final messenger to come. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you have to be a good practicing Hindu, it's mentioned in Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 5, verse number 7, verse number 9, verse number 15, that the Kalki Avatar has been described, that his father's name is Vishnu Yas, that the servant of Allah, Abdullah. Mother's name is Sumati, which means peace and serenity, that's Amina. He'll be born in the village by the name of Sambala, peaceful village, that's Makkah. He'll be born in a family of the chieftains of the village of Makkah. He will have four companions, talking about four Khulfa Rashidin. He will get the first revelation in a cave, that's Gare Hira. He will migrate northwards and come back. He went to Medina and came back. Several, several. So if you're a true Hindu, even though the scriptures have got corrupted, have been concocted, if you think the full scripture is the word of God, you have to follow the Kalki Autar. You have to believe in the last and final messenger. So if you want to follow the structure, and if you do research, you will come to the same last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Same with Buddhism, 
Same with Judaism, same with Christianity, same with Hinduism. So what I tell them, based on the verse of the Quran, of Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. Come to common terms as been us and you. What is different, we keep it aside. What is common, let us agree. Let us follow. The first thing is, Allah na illallah. That he worship none but Allah. So what we realize, that what is different, we'll discuss tomorrow. What is common, let us agree to follow. Let us agree to follow what is mentioned in the Bible, in the Jewish scriptures, Christian scriptures, Hindu scriptures. God is one. He has got no idols. He has got no image. Idol worship is wrong. All the scriptures mention about the last and final messenger. So my question to them is, then why don't you follow it? Why don't you follow and believe only in one God? Don't do idol worship, worship him alone. And why don't you follow the last and final messenger? And my question to you, brother, is, if you're a Hindu, I think you're a Hindu. Okay? So why don't you follow your scripture, which says that there's only one God? It says, Nata Sepati Masti. Sita Sita Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. In Yajurved, chapter 32, verse number 3. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima means Almighty God has got no image, has got no photograph, has got no painting, has got no portrait, has got no statue, has got no sculpture, has got no idol. I'm asking you, do you believe in one God? Do you believe? I do. Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Uh, no. So why don't you follow your Veda? I, I tell you one thing. Uh, it's not necessary. You need an idol or you need a picture or you need a light, you know. Idol is just created so you can focus, you know. It's for few people, those who cannot focus, for them, I mean, there is an idol so that you can focus properly. Correct. This is what is said to me by the pundits. They tell me, Dr. Zakir Naik, we have read the scripture, we agree with you totally. Idol worship is wrong. But what happened, those who are initial, you know, toddlers, in the early stage of life, you require idol to concentrate. When you reach higher consciousness, no idol is required. I tell them, we Muslims have reached the higher consciousness. We don't require idol. <laughs> this is the explanation given to you by a pundit, not by a scripture. It is by a pundit. I tell them, isn't it mentioned idol worship is wrong? He says, we know. It is like my son, when he goes to second standard, the basics of maths is 2 plus 2 is 4. He says, son, 2 plus 2 is 5. You continue reading that. When you reach standard 10th, I will tell you 2 plus 2 is 4. I'll be the biggest fool. Because 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 is the basic equation of maths. God has got no idol. is the basic thing of God. How can you teach the basics wrong in the lower classes and higher classes? This is told to you by your pundits and your scholars, not by your scripture. So I'm asking you, do you want to follow your scripture or do you want to follow your pandit? I want to follow my scripture. Correct. So your scripture says, Almighty God has got no image, has got no idol. So do you yet believe in idol worship? No. Fine. So you used to believe, now you have stopped. Excuse me. I said the idol is meant for the few people who cannot concentrate. I didn't say that I, Correct. I believe so in So that means you want to diminish God? For example, brother. I'm asking you a question. Yes, you sir. are helping someone. What's your name? Rajesh. Rajesh. You are helping someone, maybe in Sri Lanka. Every month, you send him maybe 20,000 rupees, maybe 2,000 dirham for his education. He doesn't know who this Rajesh is. He says, who this Rajesh? I don't know. So what does he do? He takes a cockroach, and every day in the morning, he says, Rajesh, thank you. Rajesh, thank you. Will you like it? No. Will you like it? No. Are, but he doesn't know how Rajesh looks. So he's making a cockroach out of Rajesh. You will tell him, if you don't know how I look, at least take my name, it is sufficient. Why are you making a cockroach out of me? So God is so powerful, you want to make God into that small idol. If the idol falls, the idol breaks. The idol can't help himself, what will the idol help you? So what we say, don't belittle God, don't abuse God. Oh, if you don't know how he looks, only take his name. Why do you have to insult God? If you only say, Rajesh, thank you, without making a cockroach, you'll be more happy. And compared to you and us, we are human beings, God is... You cannot compare God. You cannot say he's million times more powerful. He is unlimited. You cannot compare God and human beings. So how can you make God into an image and restrict him 
to an idol. It's insulting God. That's what the scriptures say. That he has got no pratima. You can give him attributes, but don't give him an image. Hindu scripture says that. Christian scripture says that. Quran says that. So now do you agree that even for concentration, making idol of God is wrong? Could be. Could be. Not yet sure. Not yet sure, huh? Your scripture says don't make. Your pundit says make. So do you want to follow your pundit or your scripture? No scriptures. And I'm giving you reference. I'm quoting in Sanskrit. If you don't know Sanskrit, open a dictionary, Pratima. You ask your pundit. There's a person, joker-looking person, wearing a cap and a coat and a tie. He is quoting scripture. Is it right? If you can't find the book, you can go to our center in Bombay IRF. We have all these scriptures. So I'm trying to get you closer to your scripture. So now you convinced that idol worship is wrong. See, my question was, what about millions and billions of people who are following Hinduism and Jainism, Brother, Buddhism? Millions of Does billions that of... exist or not? Okay, I agree with your, with your thing. We should not do idol worship. But my question is, I mean, what about millions and billions? They have sentiments. They follow so much. So does that structure exist or it doesn't exist? The structure exists, but it is wrong structure. The structure what so they So you mean to say everybody should follow Allah? Everyone should follow the Creator. See, but then, do why don't you say Allah? only Allah? Why because can't we say God? Ah, why can't we preach very, more about peace, love, very, humanity? Very good. Why don't Rather I, than we talk about Hinduism. Why don't I say God? I'll come to it. We'll come one by one. One question at a time, no problem. I'm a plane is early in the morning, so I can stay. Why not call God? You know why? Because God can be played around with. Allah cannot be played. If you add S to God, it becomes God's. There's nothing like plural Allah. Kul ho Allah ho ad. Say is Allah one and only. If I add D-E-S-S -S to God, it becomes Goddess, female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. You cannot play mischief with the Arabic word Allah. You can play mischief with the English word God. If I add father to God, becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah, Abba or Allah Father in Islam. If you add mother to God, becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah, Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. Allah is a pure Arabic word. You cannot play mischief. Same way, Khuda. You can have Khudadar. You know, Ishwar becomes Parmeshwar. All these words can be played around with. You show any other word which cannot be played around, I will use it, no problem. You should not go against the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm saying in Arabic, but when I speak to non-Muslims, I sometimes use God. Knowing very well that God is not the appropriate translation of Allah. But while translating even in Shahada, I'm using the word God. Knowing very well, it is not the correct definition. You are talking about, what about the millions and billions of people? Do they have the structure right, brother? Millions will come later on. I am bothered about you first. I am bothered about Rajesh. The million people, God will tell me when you met Rajesh. Why didn't you speak to Rajesh? Million people will come to later on. Whether right or wrong. Fine. I am asking you, brother. I am bothered about you. I am concerned about you because I love you. Thank you. Thank you. So I love you. Therefore, I am asking, are you convinced that idol worship is wrong? Yeah, I, I did say yes. Yes, very good. Are you convinced that the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? According to your scripture. I don't have much knowledge, you know, whatever. I mean, I listen more to you. I've read about your book. You listen more <laughs> to me than your scriptures. No, no. I've, I've read uh, many uh, scholars. I hear them, their cassettes, their videos. So I'm a little confused, you know, like, I don't know whom to believe, whom not to believe. But the, I mean, there are millions and billions of people, you know. So I don't know whether, I mean, see, I'm born in Hindu family. So it's very difficult to, you know, to transform or to convert or to change. But I was just confused, you know, because you always, always, always have seen that with the examples of Gita and our books, you try to prove that there is Allah and there is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Much so much. I was just confused. What about, what about us then? What we are praying at? Are we, I mean, are we praying wrong way or what? Or we just have to, you know, like follow you, what you say. Don't follow what I am saying, follow what God is saying. In your scripture, there's something like Shashtang. You know Shashtang? Shashtang in Sanskrit means eight parts of the body. So the right way to pray in Hinduism is touching the eight parts of your body. In Islam, a beloved Prophet said that when you do sujood, 
you touch your forehead, you touch your nose, you touch your two hands, your two knees, and the two feet, eight parts. In your Hindu scripture also, the real way to pray is Shashtang, touching the eight parts of your body. Don't get confused. I'm giving you from your scripture. I want to remove your confusion. I'm asking when your pandits speak, tell them, go and check up. Don't just follow me blindly. You say you listen to my speeches, you feel the speeches are logical. So when it is logical, when you go to school, teacher tells you two plus two is four, she convinces you agree. So sir, when both the books are saying same, the both the religions are saying the same. So why can't we speak about peace and love rather so than talking about one religion? That's what I'm talking about, peace. That follow one God who is your creator. If you want to get peace, you can only get peace by following the commandments of one creator. Though the religious books are different, what I'm trying to point out, the commonalities, I'm not criticizing Hinduism, I'm not criticizing Christianity, I can give a bigger speech of differences between Hindu scriptures and Islamic scriptures. I can give a bigger talk and a longer speech on differences between Bible and Quran. But my aim is not to spread enmity, my aim is to spread peace. So because my aim is to spread peace, I'm taking the commonalities and telling you the common point of both these religions, both these scriptures is believing in one God. I'm trying to spread peace. Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to God. The ultimate peace is not only no war. No war, no fighting is only temporary peace. The ultimate peace is peace of mind, peace at heart, and peace in the next life. What I'm trying to propagate is not only peace in this world, peace in the next life. That's the reason I'm trying to get all the different human beings and telling them, do little research, spend little time, try and understand who our creator is, try and submit your will to this creator. What I request you to do is, Submit your will to Almighty God. Follow the instructions of the last and final messenger and then, inshallah, you'll get total peace. Thank you. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the sister's mic. Assalamu alaikum. Brother, this sister is uh, from Botswana. Her name is Kay. Uh, she is, insists that she will not ask on the mic, so she's asked me that I should ask for her. But I made her stand so that you know that this is the sister whose question it is. She wants to know why do Muslim men rarely smile? Is it prohibited in Quran to smile? Only men. Sister asked that why do Muslim men rarely smile? Sister, I'm a Muslim man. And you can see a white smile on my face. Mashallah, I can see many men out here. I can't see the ladies. So I cannot tell ladies are smiling or not now. At least the men in front of me, most of them are smiling, Mashallah. Maybe the picture they see on the television, on BBC and CNN, a Muslim with gun, wearing a turban, terrorist. So maybe she's seeing too many, maybe movies of Hollywood, or maybe Bollywood, or maybe watching these channels. But mashallah, see here I'm giving a religious talk. I'm smiling, and hope you can see on the screen. And even the Muslim men, mashallah, here are smiling. So it is a misconception that if you're religious, then you can't enjoy life. If you are religious, you can enjoy life, but enjoy it according to the commandments of our Creator. Don't enjoy in the wrong way. People think if you want to enjoy life, you have to have wine, women, and wealth. It's a misconception. Wine is not required. The woman floating around is haram. Yes, woman as a wife, legal wife, with permission of the Creator, no problem, enjoy. Therefore, the Quran says, in Surah Room chapter 30, verse 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put love and mercy between the hearts of the husband and wife. Wealth also, you enjoy wealth in the right way. So sister, in Islam, nowhere does the Quran say that you should not smile, you should not laugh. Yes, the Quran says do not laugh at others. Quran says in Surah Hujura chapter 49, verse number 11, that let not one group of men laugh at the others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Don't let one group of women laugh at the other. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. So laughing and mocking at others is haram. It's prohibited. But laughing with others is permitted. So don't laugh at others. Laugh with others. Hope that answers the question. And you should not joke at others. If it's for a reason which is legitimate, no problem. 
Hope that answers the question. The next question from the brothers Mike on my left. Hi, my name is Rahul. I'm a banker by profession. I just wanted to ask you one thing. Like ever since I have the sense of religion, we have heard that God is one, and we are hearing it again as the God is one. But just now we had two people going as per you call Shahada or what? What you call is there is no God except Allah. And continuing what did you just tell Mr. Rajesh that whatever religion which came into existence before Islam, this Islam corrected the some ways out of this and some ways out of that, that there were some mistakes in the religions before Islam and Islam corrected the things and the messenger, the last messenger what you're just talking about, he corrected them all and now you have to follow the things again. So are you denying the fact that there was no God except Allah before Islam, like there was no Lord Shiva, there was no Lord Ganesha as per Hinduism or as per something. So are you totally denying the fact according to Islam? So as you say, there is no God except Allah? That was asked a very good question. He said that when I say and I give the shahada that there's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is a messenger, do you mean to say that Islam came and corrected? So before Islam, there was no God. And that's what I mean to say, brother, there's a slight misunderstanding. Islam is not a new religion. Islam did not come into existence 1400 years back. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of Islam. Islam is there since time immemorial. It is there since man set foot on the earth. And Prophet Muhammad is not the founder of the religion of Islam. He is the last and final messenger. So before Hinduism came into existence, Islam was there. And Allah clearly says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in the Dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. And the message is repeated in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 85 that if anyone takes any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. He'll be amongst the loser. Meaning, there is only one religion, Islam. The first prophet was Prophet Adam. Peace be upon him. Many other prophets came. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name, we know only 25 in the Quran. Adam, Abraham, Noah, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. Now, my name I know 25 only in the Quran. You may tell me that, don't you believe in Ram? Don't you believe in Krishna? I say, I don't know. Were they prophets of God? I say, I don't know. Maybe they were, maybe they were not. Maybe they were, maybe they were not. Because they are not mentioned in the Quran, I don't know. Maybe they were, maybe they were not. But all the messengers that came before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were sent only for those people at that time. Their message was time-bound. But because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, his message was not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it is meant for the whole of humanity. That's why Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, illa rahmatil alameen that we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the human beings. Similarly, all the scriptures that came before, my name only four are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. But Quran says in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38, in every age I've sent a revelation. There were many books sent. I don't know my name. You ask me, can you call Veda the word of God? Maybe, maybe not. But even if it's the word of God, all the scriptures that came before the Quran, they were meant only for those people in that time. Now, because there was time bound, Almighty God did not think it fit to preserve it. Now, because Quran is the last and final revelation, Quran, when it was revealed about 14 years back, it was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was sent for the whole of humanity. Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse number 1, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse 52, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 85, in Surah Zumur, chapter 39, verse 41, that the Quran was sent for the whole of humanity. It was not sent only for the Muslims and the Arabs. So today, no, but I think we are not talking about uh, the humanity, we are talking about the Islam. That Islam is totally denying the fact that there is no God except Allah. Correct. What, what I am trying to say outright here is, like just, you just told me that it is written in Quran, that may not be written in Quran or it is not written in Quran, that there were some ways, there were some scriptures written or not. So it means there was a mistake by the writers, or uh, by the scholars or Correct. scriptures of the Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism that they did not mention that there is some God existing? Very good question. 
what I'm telling you, if you heard my answer correctly, you will understand. I said all the scriptures that came before, because they were not meant to be followed till eternity, God did not think it fit to preserve it. If you heard my answer, there were many scriptures, my name I know only four. But because they are not supposed to be followed today, why should I do research on it? By this you are meaning that there was no Ramayana, there was no Mahabharat? Brother, you have not no, heard me. I'm, I'm asking you something. I'm telling you there were many scriptures. No, but like now also it has been proved geographically that there was uh, like uh, proofs getting down that there was Ramayana, there was that uh, pulls, setus and what you have heard also okay, about. Okay, you want to know about so, Ramayana? I no, can no, speak it has been Ramayana. proved. I, I mean to say. I will tell you the proof I now. mean to say. Like, Fine, now you're asking me a question. What are saying that God... I'm giving you information now. You are talking about Ramayana and Mahabharata. I don't know what your knowledge is about Ramayana and Mahabharata. I'm asked how many types of Ramayana are there? No, I really don't know about you don't that. Know. I just know the basic version of the Ramayana. You know, I'll tell you. We have heard of it and we have seen. I will tell you, brother. According to Ramanuja, who is a great scholar of Ramayana, he says there are more than 300 different types of Ramayana. Okay. 300 different types. Which one do you follow? No, I mean the basic, the base, basic characteristics, the basic. Quran, the Quran, Quran, only one. They may be sects, they may call themselves Shia, Sunni, Anifi, so Shafi. Only Quran is one. So are you openly or behind the stage or behind the curtain trying to deny the fact that hmm. there is no God except Allah? Not denying the fact, telling the fact that there was no God besides Allah, there is no God besides Allah, there will not be a God besides Allah. <laughs> I think there is a final answer to me, I have taken from you. Thank you very much. But, but coming to your question. Coming to your question, you fail to realize that Islam is not a new religion. Islam no, is no, there. I have my due uh, respect to the Quran, to the religion, Islam Correct. religion. There is no doubt about the Quran. There is no doubt about the uh, Holy Messenger and everything else. What I'm my only concern before the start, at the end of the session, the only concern was, are we denying the fact that there is no God except Allah? So you are totally saying that there is uh, Hindus have no lords. Buddhism no, no. no. Even Hinduism says the same thing, brother. That's you what I'm saying. Of, even Hinduism says, Na tasya patima asti. Of that God, there is no image. We but, cannot challenge the sentiments of the Hindus. Not challenge. Hindus. By challenging the sentiment, if you're going against the instruction of your creator, you are not obeying him. You cannot say, I'm sentimental, therefore I'm to kill anyone. I'm sentimental, I'm to insult anyone. No, but you are insulting God. But instructor never told us also this thing that you cannot... Uh, uh, play me by creating my idol or something it like is that. Mentioned. This is, this is it the is internal is sentiment of the uh, not uh, this internal. Follower. It is mentioned in Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. What? Don't make an image of Almighty God and you're making. So you're going against the commandment of your scripture, not my scripture, your but, scripture. But what I'm trying to tell you that if you call yourself a Hindu, which Hindu? A Hindu who believes in Vedas. A Hindu who believes in Mahabharat. You are talking about scientific thing. If I talk about scientific thing, do you know Mahabharat? Mahabharat was a story told by the grandfather of Arjun. Initially, Mahabharat contained only 8,000 shlokas. Later on, it contained 24,000 shlokas. Today, it contains more than 100,000. Where did it come from? Moment the story was told, generation down generation, everyone kept on adding their family members as heroes. So today's scholars say the original Mahabharat, which was a story told of the feud between two families, Pandavs and Kauravs was 8,000 verses. Today it's 100,000. Where did the 92,000 come from? No, I think we swayed away from what we were discussing. Not swayed away. So therefore, this Mahabharata has got interpolation. Not me. The Hindu scholars say that. The Hindu scholars, if you read, they say it's an interpolation, not Dr. Zakir. I read their books, but I'm enlightening you. Your Pandit may not be telling you. And what I'm telling you, you're talking Mahabharat. You know Kurukshetra. Do you know where Kurukshetra is today? Yeah. Do you know how big it is? Yeah. How big? Your Mahabharata tells that there are Akshohoni. When he started from morning till night, he was keeping on riding the chariot. There were 18 Akshohoni. Each Akshohoni contains about 100,000 elephants and few hundred thousand horses. You know the Kurukshetra is so small. Where can it fit? Suppose I tell you in this hall, one million people came for my lecture. You will tell Dr. Zakinag is a fool. I think that brother, Kurukshetra has been geographically uh, attained the name of Kurukshetra now. Brother, At that time, the whole area was called as Kurukshetra. So brother, I have you read Mahabharat? I've not read, but I have heard of it. So I this is the problem. You have heard, I have read. I am giving you reference. I am a person who is a medical doctor. I am telling you, brother, 
you have diabetes, don't touch sugar. But I've heard somewhere having sugar is good for diabetes. I said, brother. No, I was I'm giving you answer for what just you, you said that one million horses cannot be bounded in this small uh, arena or whatever. I said... Not horses. Not horses. Audience, audience. Horses don't come to listen to my lecture. I'm sorry to everybody else otherwise. You are calling the audience horses. No, no, no. My answer was to you like that time. The Kurukshetra was not defined as an area. It was defined. It is, it is defined in the Mahabharat. The area is defined. The boundaries are given. Today, if you, if you find out, not down, even in the scriptures. The scripture says what it is. I mean, geographical script. Location. Yeah, geographical location. Scripture says what was Lanka. 50 miles away from my home. Uh, home, home from home. your home, but do you know your scripture? Your scripture is miles away from your mind. I think we are swearing off from what you were discussing. Not swearing, I'm telling you scientifically, if you do research, you come to know there is so much of concoction. There's so much of interpolation. I'm not here to criticize the scripture. Now, because you're talking about scientific proof and logic, I'm coming to that. No, that's it, what I'm the more you speak about science... Mr. Singh, my only concern was, like, if you also believe that before Islam, there were scriptures, there were, Islam, God, there were God mentioned in it, there was everything mentioned in it, then the, why are we denying it today that there is no God except brother, Allah? My question to you is, Islam is there since time memorial. So where is the question of before Islam? No. Before Islam, there were no human being. When human being came, Islam was there. So where is the question of saying before I, I, Islam? I think this is a so, your, I, so your knowledge of Islam is less. You may think Islam came into existence 1400 years back. You know Hinduism, Hindu scriptures, the scholars say, majority say, Hindu scriptures came into existence 4000 years back. Islam did not come 4000 years back. Islam is a still time memorial. We don't know how many years, millions and millions of years. So for you to say before Islam, before also there was no God but Allah, today also there is no God but Allah, even after millions and billions of years afterwards, there will be no God but Allah. This it is just a matter of belief among all the religions. So as I all the religions, all including, religion. including Hinduism, this is the belief. Including Christianity, this is the belief. Including Islam, this is the belief. Including Hinduism, this is the belief that the God is one. I never say that there is no God except Lord Shiva or Lord Ram. That was my concern. Thank you very much. Lord Shiva is avatar. If you say messenger, I've got no problem. But the moment you say God, Lord Shiva is a different God, Krishna is a different God, Ram is a different God, that means you are going against your scriptures saying that ikkam evidityam, God is only one without a second. So what I realize, your knowledge, because being limited, you are telling me as a medical doctor, if I'm telling you, you have diabetes, there's problem in your pancreas, etc., have less sugar. No, 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 I have read, you know, sugar is good for energy, calories. Are bhai, it is poison for you. No, no, no. I say, what can I do? No, I think the debate on this can go on for the night long, so I won't take much of your time. Thank you very much for your so kind answer. And I pray to Allah to guide you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the next question from the uh, mic for the sisters. The sister is also very shy. She just doesn't want to come in front or ask it herself. She says her question is about will of Allah. She says, I keep hearing everything is the will of Allah. Whatever happens is the will of Allah. And they say that everything is written already. So then where is the freedom of choice? When Allah gave me freedom of choice, whatever I do, if anything happens, they say, oh, this was written and it's the will of Allah. And if you could explain if there is so much, everything is written down, then what is my freedom of choice? Sisters asked a very good question, very important question. That if everything is the will of Allah, then where is this freedom of choice? And this is a question not only asked by non-Muslims, even asked by Muslims. It's talking about Qadr. That if it is mentioned in destiny, that I'm going to rob. And if I rob, who's to blame? Allah is to blame. If it is mentioned in my destiny, I'm going to commit murder. And I commit murder. Who's to blame? Allah is to blame. So where is the free will? So if it is the will of Allah, or if it is mentioned in the destiny, I'm joining both together, then where is the free will? The reply to this question is, it's compulsory that every Muslim should believe in Qadr. But you should understand what is the meaning of destiny. For example, if suppose in a classroom, there are 100 students, and when the teacher teaches the students in the classroom at the end of the year, before the examination, the teacher predicts that this student, he will come out first class first. This student, he'll get second class. This student, he will fail. The teacher predicts why? He knows that this student is very studious, always does homework, does extra studies. This average student, second class, that student goes for movies, doesn't do homework, 
misses the class, predicts that that student will fail. Now, once the examination takes place, after the results come out, this student gets first class first, this student gets second class, that student fails. I am asking you a question. Can the student who has failed, can he blame the teacher that because we have predicted I will fail, I have failed? Who's to blame, the student or the teacher? Who's to blame, the student or the teacher? The student. The teacher predicted. Who's to blame the student? He did not study. He did not do his homework. He used to go for extra movies. So similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being the free will. Allah has told you what is right, what is wrong, but the choice is yours. For example, if you come at a crossroad, there are four roads, A, B, C, D. You can choose any. You choose road C. So Allah knows in advance that when you come at crossroad, you will choose road C. So Allah writes, when the person comes at the crossroad, he will choose road C. So it is not because Allah is writing that you are choosing, because you will be choosing Allah is writing. It is not because Allah is writing that you are choosing road C. It is because you will be choosing road C. Allah is ilm gab He has knowledge of the future. He writes in advance. Now after you choose road C, you come at another crossroad, five roads, one, two, three, four, five. Like after you pass the 12th standard, you can become engineer, you can become doctor, you can become businessman. You choose to become a businessman. Choice is yours. But Allah knows in advance that after you pass standard 12th, you will choose to become a businessman. It is not because Allah is writing that you're becoming a businessman. Because you wanted to become a businessman, Allah is writing in advance. And what you understand here, that if Allah wants, He can easily change it. For example, if in a classroom, in the mathematics examination, the teacher gives the paper 2 plus 2 is equal to how much? Now why is she supervising? The student writes 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. The teacher will not correct, the teacher can correct. But if the teacher corrects, you will say the teacher is unjust. If teacher says, don't write 5, write 4. All the other students will say, this is examination. Why are you interfering? So if Allah wants, He can change. But because He has given you free will, He is letting you take your decision. So this life is a test for the hereafter. As Allah says in Surah Mulk chapter 6 and verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life is a test for the hereafter. Allah has given you and shown you the rules, what is good, what is bad. Then He's given you a free will. It is your choice. Allah does not interfere in your free will. He can if He wants. The Quran says, not even a leaf can fall without the permission of Allah. So whatever happens, happens with Allah's free will, but the decision is yours. And based on that, you will be rewarded or punished. Hope that answers the question. We'll have the next question from the brothers Mike in the center. Hello, doctor. Uh, my question pertains to the point you're talking about. My name is Naresh. And my question pertains to the point that you were making about intoxicants, small intoxicants, like you have in small quantities or big quantities, it's the same thing. It is an intoxicant. So how does it boil down to like smoking? Like it's a small intoxicant, like whatever high you have, it's for like five seconds, 10 seconds. How do I convince a Muslim friend of mine who says that's a gray area? There's nothing like, uh, it's not permitted, but it's not uh, banned or it's not uh, totally not allowed as such. MashaAllah, our non-Muslim friend Naresh, wants to convince his Muslim friend uh, that as, well. as far as smoking is concerned. He said what intoxicates in large quantity is prohibited in a small quantity that's the hadith of beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number 4 in the book of intoxication. Book number 30, hadith number 3392. But this, as far as smoking is concerned, all type of smoking is not intoxicants. But I know ganja, charas is intoxicant. So that falls in the intoxicants. But if it's not intoxicating, previously there was a fatwa amongst the shuks. There's a hadith which says that don't have onions because it smells. So when you go for salah, don't have onions, it has got bad breath. So based on that hadith, people used to say that smoking is makru because it smells. Because of lack of knowledge of science. Today, we have come to know that tobacco in any form, smoking, chewing, etc. is the second largest cause of death. The first largest cause of death is alcoholism. Several millions of people die every year. 
it is the single largest cause of death. More than terrorism, more than war. Every year, millions of people die. The second largest cause of death is tobacco. According to World Health Organization, every year, more than 4 million people die only because of tobacco. Now, based on this, there's a verse of the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 195, which says, Do not make your own hands the cause of your own destruction. That means committing suicide or causing self-loss is prohibited. So based on this verse, today we come to know smoking is nothing but slow poisoning. So based on this verse today, there are more than 400 different fatwas from different parts of the world that smoking is haram, tobacco is haram. Only in India where I come from, there the scholars say makru, because many have tobacco, so they say makru. But today, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, many parts of the world, there are more than 400 fatwas saying that smoking and tobacco in any form, nicotine is haram. So Islamically today, smoking is haram based on the verse of the Quran, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 195, do not make your own hands the cause of your destruction. So tell this to your friend, give the reference of the Quran, inshallah he'll be convinced if he's a good Muslim. We'll have the next question from the brother's mic. Uh, just one question I have. You told me, we heard about uh, that the Vedas say that don't make any images of the God. Yeah, Whoever worships anything uh, which has been created throws himself in darkness, right? The difference between Bhagwan and Allah is that Allah says that if you worship anyone apart from me, I will punish you forever and ever, and I will not spare you of this sin. But nowhere in Hinduism's books would you see that Bhagwan is saying, Ke if you worship anything apart from me, you will be put in Narak, which is uh, the Hindi word for uh, hell, forever and ever. Now, what, why I'm saying that to you is, the concept of God in Islam, Christianity and Judaism is the same in which he feels bad if anyone worships anything else apart from him. But the concept of the other side of the religions, which is Hinduism, Buddhism or those sides, the concept of God there, I think, is more, the God of those religions is more large-hearted because he doesn't say to you, that I'm going to put you in hell if you don't worship me. Although, although I understand that it is wrong to worship idols, it is wrong to worship created things. But I do feel that because that, uh, I, I somehow feel that, you know, basically God, there is nothing like Him, right? So why in the Quran or the Bible or the Jews scripture, we are attributing a human uh, feeling to God that, let us say, my father gives me everything, he gives me all the money, and I give that money to the poor people, right? Now, one day, if I forget my father, yeah, so my father will feel bad. But this is a human nature. God is more large-hearted than that. Even if I don't worship him, he should have no problems. You know, he should not put me to hell because that's egoistic. Egoism is a part of human nature, not of God, is what I feel, according to my uh, understanding. Rules. Brother Rahul is an old friend of mine, mashallah. Whenever I come to Dubai, no question answer session goes without him asking a question. He's following me since many years. When I came in 2005, when I came last year, and yesterday night, we had a good session for a couple of hours. And though he didn't mention his name, he's Rahul, mashallah. And we pray that may Allah guide him. Inshallah, may Allah give hidayah. And he asks very good questions. Always difficult questions. Very good questions. I like it. It's a challenge for me. He asks me new questions. I like challenges. And always I say he asked a good question. This is one of my last questions, sir. Uh, one of my last questions. Last question before you accept Islam. One of my last questions. <laughs> before you accept Islam. Clarify this. Uh, it just struck me, actually. I was... He told me he will not accept Islam in public, so I don't know problem. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Will so you I, clarify me on this? I'll clarify with you, and I won't ask you to accept Islam in public. We have done that yesterday. Sir, Islam is a glorious religion, and I I'm... am. it's given me a lot of peace, and I can say many good things about it, but please clarify. And you told... Else. I'll clarify. You told me you have spent more time studying Islam 
then what you spend time in getting your degree of engineering it is right yes. that's right and i enjoyed more therefore i enjoy your questions also the brother asked a very good question very attacking very tricky difficult question that he understands that all the religions christianity islam hinduism say there's no god except one god don't make images don't make idols but islam goes a step further he will forgive any other sin except the sin of shirk surah nisa chapter 4 verse 48 surah nisa chapter 4 verse 116 but in hinduism no way does it say that if you do shirk allah will not forgive you before i ask your question about large heartedness no way does the quran say that if you commit a murder allah will not forgive you brother no way does the quran say that if you commit murder Allah will not forgive you. Does it mean that I will go and commit murder? Brother. Repeat again, sorry. No way does the Quran say that if you commit murder, though it is the second largest sin in Islam, in the major sins, number two is committing murder of an innocent human being. Yes. After shirk is murder. Though the Quran says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 32, that if anyone kills any innocent human being, unless it be for murder, or for creating corruption in the land, it is as though you have killed all of humanity. But nowhere does the Quran say that if you commit murder, Allah will not forgive you. Allah will never forgive you. Does it mean that I will go and commit murder? No. Yeah, enough. Same way, when the Vedas don't mention that if you don't do shirk, Allah will not forgive you, you should not do shirk. I understand. I understand. Very good. You are an understanding person. I'll come to the large hearted one afterwards. I haven't answered your full question. I've only answered the first part of your first question. I'll come to your large heartedness afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll come to it. That's fine. Yeah. But I like, you know, cutting down the questions so that you understand better. Yes. Or if you understand, the other people also should understand. You know, you're an intelligent person, I know that. Sure. Mashallah, engineer done from UK. That's what he told me yesterday. Now, coming to your part of large heartedness. Yeah. That in Islam, if you don't do this, I'll punish you. That is a human nature. That if the father gives money to the son, son gives in charity, tomorrow the son doesn't ask about the father, so father feels bad. It's human nature. I agree with you. God is far superior. I agree with you. Yes. So why does God feel bad? Yes. Very good question. Very intelligent question. Inshallah, you'll get convinced. I won't ask you to accept Islam in public. Oh, sure. <laughs> that we have done that yesterday. Yes. The Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you. You require him. Now coming to the question. Now, I'm making your question more easy. Mm -hmm. Why we have to say Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest? Allah asks you to say Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. Tomorrow, if you don't say Allah is the greatest, do you think Allah will become less? No. No. Yeah. Whether you say or not, Allah is already the greatest. Irrespective whether you say or not, it will make no difference. Not even an iota of difference. He is already the greatest. He will remain irrespective whether you say or not. Why does he ask you to say that is the question. The question is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the human psychology. For example, your mother has a heart attack. And now, you have heard of a very famous heart specialist in the world. If you know he's famous, he will give you some advice for your mother. Another person who's unknown, he comes and gives you advice. Whose advice will you follow? Uh, repeat again, sorry. Uh, if? if your mother has a heart attack. Yeah. There's a person who you know is the most famous heart specialist yeah, in the world. I would follow the advice of the specialist. Why? Because you know he's number one, he's most famous. Yeah. So the reason Allah asks you to praise him is not for his benefit, it's for your benefit. Because the moment you praise Allah, you will follow his advice. Agreed. By following his advice, Allah will not benefit, you will benefit. Yes. By the doctor giving advice to you, he will not benefit. Yes, you may give him fees, so that way he'll benefit. You aren't giving any fees to Allah. Yes. So Allah doesn't benefit anything. But at the moment you praise Him, it is human. When you say, Allah is the most wise, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the most merciful, most wise, ah, He gives advice, I'll follow. Most greatest, I'll follow Him. Most merciful, I'll follow Him. So you say all these praises not to benefit Him, to benefit yourself. Agreed. Yes. So when you worship Him, mm -hmm. it does not benefit Him, it benefits you. Yes. When you follow the advice of the doctor, mm -hmm. it will benefit if you give Him fees. Yes. Yes. You don't give any fish to Allah. Yes. It benefits you. Yes. So same way, Allah is large-hearted. Yes. By punishing you, hmm. do you think he will benefit? No. 
by punishing he becomes a, a, I is the I'm coming to it brother Rahul yeah yeah let yeah. me complete my answer sure sure yeah by punishing you he will not benefit but he is giving you a fear why if you have alcohol he will punish you if you have drugs he'll punish you whether you have drugs or what different does it make to him now if he says okay don't have drugs but if you have drugs i will not punish you then will you have drugs or not you laugh if i give an examination right to no i won't have if i if i'm convinced it's wrong for me i won't have ah, i don't need that fear of the hell the right. fear of the hell i have to be put in my mind yes to yes. avert me god convinces people in different ways some people with reason and logic you are a logic person you are convinced with logic some people want fear some people want punishment some people want reward there are three four types of ways which allah speaks you get convinced with reason and logic you are like me yeah you are like me yes, yes some people they are not convinced with reason logic ah, leave logic ha ah, i'll get reward i'll do it i'll get punishment i'll stay away so it's lekin sach kya hai hota kya hai reality mein uh, does it the, is the fear is is it reality wo yes. hoega yes i'll tell you i'll tell you i'll tell you reality is that the hell fire is there and the punishment is there Brother, right let, let me complete the answer yeah yeah uh, will you allow me to complete the answer or you yes please let me complete i'll give you a chance ji ji i'll give you a chance to say that you are convinced yes but before i complete my answer you interjecting sure sure yeah please After I come, I'll give you a chance and ask you. Sure. Yeah. Now, there's a teacher taking an examination. Two plus two is how much? Four. Convinced? Now, there are some people. The teacher says, "Okay, now in the examination, those who write correctly will get plus point, will pass. Those who don't write correctly will fail." Now, when the teacher is telling hundreds of things, it's difficult for everyone to remember. But if you want to remember, you write. If you write correct, I'll pass you. If you write wrong, I'll fail you. So now the student starts memorizing. He starts like you passed your engineering. You are afraid of failing. Yes. If you wouldn't have studied, you would have failed. So the teacher says, "No problem. Even if you write wrong, I will give you pass degree. Will you study?" No. Ah. Mm -hmm. Though you are logical, yeah. you understand Boyle's law. You understand trigonometry. You understand chemistry. But to remember, you have to stay awake. You have to slog. Teacher says, "No problem. You understood. You write in the examination, right or wrong. Two plus two is three. I will pass you. Will you study?" Well, it depends. I won't, but probably someone who is more sensible would study to learn some knowledge. Correct. If the teacher says, "Now your aim is to get the degree." Yeah. Once you understand, if you fail, if you fail, you won't get the degree. Yeah. So here, Almighty God speaks logically. some people logically doesn't make a difference whether hell fire is or heaven is there other people you do it you get a reward like when you speak to your child sometimes you speak logically sometimes you say you know i'll give you a chocolate yes sometimes ek lafa marunga yeah yeah i will yeah. give you one slap yeah so yeah. this is what god knows the psychology of the human being he is a creator sometimes logic sometimes reasoning sometimes reward sometimes punishment but once he says yes to follow he can't lie once he says he has to follow so he's trying to convince you suppose your son yeah yeah i know you're not married yeah i know you're not married inshallah one day when you get married and if your son yes and your son inshallah i'll marry a muslim inshallah yes inshallah <laughs> so your son when you have a son yeah 5 years old he wants to jump from 10th floor you say my son don't jump you'll die i want to jump you know you will die no problem i want to jump One slap you'll give him, right or wrong? Yes. You'll tell him I slap you. Yes. Yet if he wants to jump, you'll slap him. A yes. father is cruel to be kind. Is your intention to hurt him? No. Your intention is to hurt him literally so that he prevents from the bigger hurt. Yes. So here, if he says no, no, I'm only acting. Maybe for some little time you'll think I'll punish you, and you don't punish him. But if he wants to jump, you'll not wait till he jumps. You will give him one tight slap. the so same way god here he tells you this is good this is bad this is reward this is punishment and once he says something he is honest in islam god is the most kind he wants the human being to improve the other god okay no problem even if you write wrong i'll pass you what kind of a teacher is this suppose tomorrow there is a student studying with you he writes wrong answers you slog you stay awake in the night this person plays hooky enjoys writes everything wrong and the teacher says both get first class first will you be happy with the teacher 
नो वाई यू आर अ वेरी अनकाइंड पर्सन वेरी क्रूएल अनकाइंड नॉट अ गुड ह्यूमन बी आई एम रॉन्ग बिकॉज यू बिलीव इन जस्टिस सो बिसाइड गॉड बींग काइंड एंड मर्सिफुल इज ऑल्सो जस्ट इमेजिन सम वन रेप्स योर सिस्टर रेप्स योर मदर गॉड से नो प्रॉब्लम I'll forgive on the day of judgment. Won't you tell God? Why no, no, that's okay. No, that's okay. I'm I'm talking about wait, God wait. being egoistic on His own. He's self. not egoistic at all. No, but He's saying if you, makes... if you do shit, then I will put you in hellfire forever and ever. I'm not saying no, no. that He should not punish wrong deeds, but He is putting on His own self that if you associate partners with me, along with worshiping me, if you worship someone else, even then I will not forgive you. That's the right thing. That's, Because that's if, egoism. If the doctor says, yes. if suppose the heart specialist tells your mother, see this is a good thing. Have only this medicine, nothing else. Someone else says, okay, have this medicine also. So that heart specialist tells you, if you mix it with something else, your mother will die. So will you listen to somebody else or not? Will you listen or not? Heart specialist saying, don't have anything else except this sorbitrate. Keep it below your tongue. Yes. Now another doctor comes. You know, I'm a very good doctor. You don't know him also. Mm. Will I you will listen, listen to, to heart specialist? Correct. Yes. Heart specialist specialized, but God is a big heart specialist. So heart specialist, you want to follow? You don't want to follow your creator who created your heart. What no, no, kind no, of no, 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 sir, wait, sir. Wait, wait, here, wait, here. wait, 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 wait. Let me complete. Yes. Let me complete. Yes, yes, yes. So you. Being logical, yeah. when you want to follow the heart specialist, when the heart specialist tell you, don't listen to anyone else because they have told you the total truth. That heart specialist can be wrong because he's a human being. Almighty God, when he says, do not worship anyone else besides me, he knows that if you think somebody else is also the greatest, hmm. and if you follow and follow something wrong, it will harm you. God does not want to see to it that his creation is harmed. He is going out of the way to give you an ultimate warning. Other sins, maybe I will forgive. Hmm. That is one type of murder. Is one type of sin very wrong? Second largest. But one, if you worship somebody else, you can do anything. You can start murdering. You can start having drugs. You can start raping. It's too dangerous. Hmm. This is the guidance. It is complete. Because he is the creator. He knows no one else is the creator. Now someone else. Tries to behave like a creator when God knows no one else can create you. It is very dangerous. That's the reason he says that following advice, worshiping anyone, obeying anyone as the creator, not obeying normally. Normally, you want to obey a father, no problem. Obey a mother, no problem. Going against the commandments of Almighty God, worshiping that somebody. That is what I'm trying to find out. Is that the right God who is saying that if you associated partners with me, I will never forgive this sin? You are taking it's a catch twenty two. I am questioning whether a God who thinks like that is that the correct God? Correct God. You are saying you Suppose. are saying he is the correct God. Hence why? he knows. Why? 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 Yes. I have checked up with science. This Quran passes yes. the test. When I put science to your Hindu scriptures, it fails. Yes. When I put science to Bible, it fails. Mm. So even if I agree with you with my earlier question, mm. maybe this is ambiguous. Fine. Eighty mm. percent is proved to be hundred percent correct. 20% hmm. is ambiguous inshallah logically even this will be right if i have to put that way but the other way if a doctor who solved the stronger argument would be ki 100% is correct 100%, 100 of it is proved that it is correct if 20% ambiguous is there i tell you one thing brother your mind hasn't reached that level my mind hasn't reached that level right the science hasn't reached that level maybe 100 years after or 1000 years after it will be proved 100% correct we are limited The problem is in you and me, not in the Quran. Similarly, but a person who is very powerful, a person who is a heart specialist, he knows this stuff very well. He'll be sure. Do this, nothing else. A person who's not sure, okay, have this medicine also, have that medicine also. So, person who's cock sure of himself, like the Creator Almighty God, he will give this commandment. Now he's cock sure. You are not cock sure about him that he's the Creator. Yes. Once you're cock sure, you'll follow. I am cock sure that this is the word of Almighty God. You aren't. Yes. So once the research gets complete, yes. You know very well that the other scriptures don't pass the test. Yes. I challenge you to get any scripture that you know of which is even close to the Quran. No, this is the strongest scripture that I've. Uh, that's so, for sure. So when you know. Yeah. I can't ask you to accept because you know we spoke yesterday. Right. Okay. But when you know it is the thing, then the ego is in you. 
not an almighty god the ego no, is in you <laughs> i don't have ego and i pray to I, almighty god i told god. you all the ones i have read this is the strongest i yeah. pray to almighty god you know because i love you rahul yes i love you too i love you that very reason i pray to almighty god to give hidayah you don't have to proclaim you asked me yesterday do i have to proclaim i said no you don't have to proclaim yes. so i think that you are a person who submit your will to god and may god guide you yes. and may you get a good submitting muslim life partner thank you <laughs> thank you the next question was due to go to the brother so we'll have the next question from the front mic good evening dr nayak uh, this is sanjay thakkar here first of all with all due respect to all my muslim brothers and sisters here before i ask my questions i would like to ask your kind make a statement first you see religion goes beyond in a supremacy or declaring supremacy over other religion uh, you know it, it's more about looking because you know god is omnipresent you know there is god in you there is god in him there is god in him there is god in everybody if we look for if we have that that vision tunnel vision having said that religion is more about tolerance peace love and humility and humanity having said that uh, i beg to differ about your last statements proclaiming that uh, you know the other scriptures have failed the test now again this could be a debate that could go on for hours and we have limitations on time so i will i'll just rest with two questions my first question to you doctor is uh, you know islam and and the quran condemns idol worship yet in the kaaba people now you had mentioned that one of the 20 misconceptions first 13 that you had covered i wasn't here at that time so no i problem. missed it so that's my first question my second one question one question at a time please no problem no, actually no is, is, go ahead it's core okay. related sort no of no problem yes yeah. yes brother my second question for you is you know i'm large hearted <laughs> tolerant thank you yes. thank you very kind of you uh, my second question to you is you know the concept of um, azan you know from what i understand the concept of azan came many many decades or centuries back when there was no clock there were no uh, you know way to actually decide what time of the day it is and and the only way people would realize that it's this time of the day for this prayer was based on azan now obviously that's not the case now you know <laughs> we have clocks and we have so then why is there azan five times a day even in this day and age these are my two questions brother last two questions before he asked this two questions he made some comments i made a statement not comments <laughs> it was it was it was a you know conclusive statement do that do you think the statement and comments are contradicting uh, well it was a it's conclusive a... statement which could be challenging your yes, your yes, your yes therefore i said you made a comment or you made a statement or you made a challenge no problem yeah take it whatever you <laughs> you would like you <laughs> want to take a challenge no problem you said that Zakir while talking about other thing you should be more tolerant etc and he said that i mentioned earlier that all the scriptures besides the quran have failed the test failed the test of science complete my sentence not the half way when you put the test of science not the test of emotion so you you quoted me half i said if you test put all the other scriptures the test of scientific facts all the scriptures that failed except the quran you told me we can have a debate fast together i am not here i can rattle off verses from the vedas and from the hindu scripture with unscientific i don't want to do it if you want to see you can see my debate with dr william campbell talking about bible and quran why i did that he wrote a book saying there are 30 scientific errors in the quran and for 8 years no muslim replied i went to chicago I had a dialogue. I answered all his questions, and I posted 38 scientific errors in the Bible. He could not reply to one. I have had debates with many of your scholars, not you, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. Many said to be number one in the world. Now, when I have spoken with them and they could not reply, now you are telling I am wrong. No, I am not. I didn't say you are wrong. You said you can have a debate for five hours. I am not interested. When I had the debate with the best. and they could not last for half an hour do you think i'm a fool to have a debate with you for five hours well limitation of time you are you are yes. prejudging my yes. intelligence sir i'm not prejudging many people they tell me dr zakir naik we want to debate with you you're not the only one many people you know what i tell them if you want to debate with me you should have a following if you can get 10000 people minimum yeah there are about 20000 someone told me 
Now, if you can get 10,000 people for your talk, you are worth debating. I'm not judging intelligence. If you're a person who has a following, I don't want to make you famous. If I have a debate with you, you'll be seen by 100 million people. You know that? Now, let me complete my answer. What I tell any non-Muslim, many hundreds of non-Muslims want to debate with me. I tell them, there are hundreds of Hindus who I know, hundreds of Christians who I know. When they speak, they have more than 10,000 people for the audience. Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, Ramdeo Baba, Christians, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, Morris Cirello, Benny Hinn. All these people, they have 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 for the gathering. You convince them and give your material to them. Let them debate me. They will never take your material knowing very well. It will not stand the test. These are scholars of your religion. What I tell you, if you really feel you have strong material and you really think you have intelligence, give this material to your Hindu who you consider to be best. Okay. And who has a following. If you say, I want to debate with you, I used to do that earlier. Now, anyone, whether good, bad, ugly, whether he's intelligent or not, if he can gather 10,000 people, that means he has a following. He's not doing it for fame. And then we will have a public dialogue. For you, you can have a dialogue with my student. When you're coming to Bombay, tell me. I have got hundreds of students. Fair many. Enough. Fair enough. You know, we have students in our school. We have many people. And they love it. So the list goes, you want to debate? Come to Bombay. Give me the time. One, two, three, four. We have many. Fair enough. Huh? May that, I have, may wait, I have wait, the wait, answers wait, wait, to wait, my wait. questions? I'm coming, I'm coming. Thank you. But because you made a challenge before, the challenge is more important than the answer. The answers I've already given many times. I'll come to it. So there, this is your assumption. This is what I say. I'm not here to criticize it unless someone forces me to. That I said because Rahul was arguing so much. That's why I said. Otherwise, in my talk, I'm not here to criticize any religion. Thank you. I'm that's, what I to hear. that's what I wanted to hear from you. Because see, but, religion but it, is beyond criticism. It's beyond... But you have to call a spade a spade. If you say, why is the teacher saying 2 plus 2 is 3 is wrong? The teacher criticizes. Are you not criticizing. If someone is forcing, no, I'm right. 2 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 2 is 3. You see, just because somebody else's perspective does not agree with yours, because he's following a different religion or sect, no religion. Two does, plus does two not is, mean that that person is wrong. Two plus two is equal to four is a universal fact. Now, someone comes from the village and tells me two plus two is three, I'll tell him with love. But yes, if he insists, I said, no, brother, it's enough. So, because I'm in this field, Alhamdulillah, I'm not here to criticize, but someone forces me to criticize, Okay, give me one example of unscientific thing. I can give you. I don't hurt the other Hindus. I want to win them over. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 34, that you get them closer with love. Win your enemy, don't defeat them. So all these people, I'm winning them over. I'm not defeating them. Neither do I want to defeat you, I want to win you, brother. Well, I, I guess if one way Inshallah, win, I will win you with your two answers. One way to win somebody is through humility. And you have reached that stage where, you know, as a person grows larger than life, yes. he becomes more humble. Correct. For you and to say that I would not challenge you, I mean, you no, know. No, but once you reach a stage, if that is causing loss, Allah also says, I'll put you in hell. He is much higher than me, infinite time. But that does not mean it should go against the message. Humility doesn't mean that me being humble to you, I'm giving a wrong signal to millions of people. Then it will be injustice. I can't be humble. Okay, two plus two is three. Very good, son. Other thousand people will start calculating two plus two is three because Zakir has said. That's not humility. That is injustice, dishonesty. Right? Now coming to your questions. Thank you. The first question the brother asked is, which he said it comes in the first 13. It was the 11th most common question or misconception in the mind of the non-Muslim that if Islam is against idol worship, why do you bow down to the Kaaba when you offer Salah? No Muslim ever worships the Kaaba when you offer Salah. Kaaba is the Qibla. It is the direction. We Muslims, we believe in unity. Now when we offer Salah, suppose you want to offer Salah here. Some will say less faith, north. Some will say south. Some will say east. Some will say west. For unity, Allah says in the Quran Surah Baqarah that wherever you are, face towards the Kaaba. So Kaaba is the Qibla, it is the direction. 
So we are facing in that direction, but no one worships the Kaaba. Previously, the Muslims were the first people to do the world map. And Al Idrusi, 1154, he drew the world map. North Pole down, South Pole was on top, and Kaaba was in the center. The Western cartographers came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole top, South Pole down. Yet the Kaaba is in the center. So if you are in the north, you face towards the south. If you are in the south, you face towards the north. If you are in the east, you face towards the west. If you are in the west, you face towards the east. Kaaba is at the center. So we pray that as a qibla, as a direction. No one worships it. Further, when we go for Umrah, or for pilgrimage, or for Hajj, we circumambulate on the Kaaba. You may ask that why do you circumambulate on the Kaaba? Why do you circle on the Kaaba? I do it because the command from Almighty God and the Prophet. But the logical reason I can think is because every circle has only one center. So when we circumambulate around the Kaaba, logically I think we are testifying this one God. Furthermore, if yet you have doubts, if you read the Hadith that's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Volume Number Two, in the Book of Hajj, Chapter Fifty Six, Hadith Number Six Seventy Five, Hadith Tumar May Allah be pleased with him. He was the second Caliph of Islam, second Khalifa. He said that this black stone pointing at the Hajj Aswad, black stone, it can neither benefit me, it can neither harm me, just because my Prophet kissed it, I'm kissing it. This statement that this black stone can neither harm anyone, nor benefit anyone, is sufficient to prove that the Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. Furthermore, at the time of the Prophet, there were Sahabas, there were companions of the Prophet who stood on the Kaaba and gave the azan. No idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol and give the azan, proving that no Muslim ever worshipped the Kaaba. It's only the Qibla. It's a direction. Coming to a second question. Hope you're convinced with the first question. Sure, I am. Thank you. Very good. Fifty percent have won you over. Now next fifty percent. Your second question was: decades earlier, centuries earlier, there was no clock, no way to keep time, so we could justify that giving azan was right. Now everything is there, clock is there, time is there. So why do we have to give the azan? Very good question. The reason we give the azan is for many things. One thing is to tell everyone it is time. You tell me one thing. Everyone has the watch during examination. Yet the teacher rings the bell. Time is up. So you tell the school teacher why are you ringing the bell that the period is up? Everyone has the watch. To tell everyone, finish time is up. Next period. So today, when we have the azan, you can have a big clock also, a big bell. But a prophet said, bell is not good. Therefore, in Christian, you have bell. Some religion, you have the drum. The prophet said, no, this is not good. No drum, no bell. Someone suggested human voice. He liked it. So better than the drum, we have called human voice. And our azan has a message. The bell. Sometimes the bell in the school has a message. Period is up. Sometimes the bell has a message. Period is starting. Sometimes the bell has a message. Different message. That fire alarm. Run away. You understand? No? Bell cannot speak. You read the bell. Okay, fire is there. Run away. In the azan, it has a message. It says, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. God is the greatest. Four times. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Washadan Muhammad Rasulullah. That I bear witness, there is no God but Allah. He is calling out. I bear witness, there is no God but Allah. And Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Hail al Salah, Hail al Salah. Come to Salah, come to Salah. Hail al Falah, Hail al Falah. Come to success, come to success. He is giving a message. God is the greatest. God is the greatest. God is the greatest. God is the greatest. Four times. There is no God but Allah. Prophet Muhammad is the messenger, giving you a message that your messenger, Prophet Muhammad, you don't have to worship him. He is only a messenger. He is the servant of God. Five times we are reminded in the azan, Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He is not Allah. Come to salah. Come to prayers. Come to prayers. Come to success. Come to success. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. So it's a message telling you it is time for prayer. At the same time, testifying there is one God. It is a message. And the beauty of it is that whichever part of the world you go, it's only in Arabic. So if you if you have in French, if you go to France, you don't understand French. You say, "What is this person shouting? Is he abusing me?" <laughs> so throughout the world, you have in Arabic. Even if I don't know Arabic, at least I know the translation of the azan. So it is a reminder. In the morning salah, 
another reminder. It says, as salatu khairu minan noom. Prayer is better than sleep. As salatu khairu minan noom. Prayer, now when you hear, ah, prayer is better than sleep, so you get up. With the ghanta, I put the snooze on. You know snooze? Another 10 minutes. Another snooze, 10 minutes. Here, as salatu khairu minan noom. Only for the morning's azan. Prayer is better than sleep. So here it's a message. Even though you have watched, you don't keep on watching. So now, because we pray in congregation, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, there are no less than three hadith in Sahih Bukhari, which says that you get 25 times, 27 times more sawab when you pray in congregation. So the azan is reminding you that the congregation is going to start. So you know once the azan is given, within 20 minutes, the congregation will start. So you get ready, you do your wudu, you do your ablution, and you go to the mosque. If it is not there, and many people don't know what is the time, it keeps on changing. I will not know what is the time for sunset today. Do you know, brother? Do you know the time for morning sunrise in Dubai? It changes every day. So what is it now you know? Not rough, rough. Most of the people here will have rough idea. So, though you are a scientific person, you have a watch. If the Adhan is there, ah, now it is time, I'll go for prayer. So even in the age of science and technology, it's a reminder. And besides the reminder, it's giving you a message. It's calling you towards the truth. It's calling you towards success. So that's the reason even 100 years, 1000 years back, it was correct. Even today, it is correct. And even tomorrow, it will be correct. Hope this convinces you. Thank you kindly. So at least in this question, I won you over. Yes, you have. Thank Inshallah. You and I pray to God to guide you and to guide me also. Thank you. The next question from the sister's mic. Yes, uh, my question is, as a Muslim wife, I know my duty is not to serve my husband's parents. But if his uh, mother is living with uh, us and she is heart patient and he's, when he's not around, what is my duty as a Muslim? Uh? Sister asked the question, I know it is not the duty of a Muslim woman to serve the parents of the husband. But if my mother-in-law is sick, and if I take care of her, what is the ruling? Sister, you have a misunderstanding. Where does the Quran say that you cannot serve the parents of your husband? Where does the Quran say that? Is there any verse in the Quran? Is there any hadith that say the Prophet said that don't serve the parents of your husband? Where does it say that? This is a misconception. What you have to realize that there are many duties. It may not be awal fard for you to serve, but serving the parents of your husband is very good, alhamdulillah. And if your husband says, you have to serve, you have to serve. What is the harm? You will get sawab. So there's no question saying that as a Muslim, you should not serve the parents. In fact, if you serve, you will be a very good wife. And inshallah, your husband would be kinder to you and you will earn more sawab. So if your mother-in-law is sick, inshallah, my advice to you is serve her, take care of her, Inshallah, that will earn you many sawab. Maybe it will be one of the important parts of you to go to Jannah. As long as your husband and your mother-in-law do not tell you to do anything against Quran and Sunnah, obey your husband, take care of them. Inshallah, that will be one of your pathways to go to Jannah. Jazakallah, brother, because I was very confused. I thought that I was only serving her when I wanted to and I would not serve her when I don't want to because it was not my duty. And my husband understand he would also never say because he knows that it is not my duty. Jazakallah khair. Do we have any other non-Muslims before we go to the next question? We do with this mic? Okay, go ahead. Uh, hello to you, sir. My name is Mohit and I am employed in an IT company. My question to you is, if there is a judgment day set and after the death, everybody has to be taken care of by God and every of their good deeds and bad deeds are to be settled uh, at the judgment day. So why since the birth a person is mad or throughout his life he is he or she is suffering from the disease and after that I mean the brother asked a very good question that if there is good and bad based on that on the day of judgment God will punish you or may reward you. So what justification it is that some people are born handicapped, some people have congenital defects, some people have heart problem. So is God unjust? Now based on this information, the Hindu scholars 
they came up with a new philosophy. If you realize, if you read the Vedas, Vedas speak about punar janam. Punar means next, janam means birth, next birth. Even Quran speaks about next birth, next life. Quran says that God has given you life, you come in this world, He'll cause you to die, He'll reject you again. So Veda says the same thing. But the Hindu scholars, they could not understand that how could God be unjust? That He makes some people born handicapped, some people wealthy, some people poor. So they came with the philosophy of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, which is not mentioned in the Vedas. He is born handicapped because in his last birth, he sinned. He is born poor because in last birth he sinned. It is their thinking, not of the scriptures. In Islam, we come in this world once and once is sufficient. Then we are resurrected and then the day of judgment. Now coming to your basic question, what reply does Islam have? Why some people are born healthy, some people with disease, with congenital defects, some people rich, some people poor. If we analyze, Quran says in several places, including Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, and Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 155. Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made your children and your wealth as a test for you. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people in different ways. Now, depending upon the test, if the examination paper is difficult, the correction is lenient. If the examination paper is easy, the correction is strict to justify. So Almighty God tests different people in different ways. Normally in an examination every year, the test paper keeps on changing. You don't have the same questions. If you have the same question, then where is the test? So now depending upon the examination you undergo, for example, one of the pillars of Islam is that you have to give zakat. Anyone who's rich, who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity. Now one person is rich, for him, he has to give zakat. A person who's poor, he has to give no zakat. So in the zakat category, he gets 100 out of 100. For the rich man, for the rich man, he may say, okay, fine, I may have 1 million dirhams. I'll give zakat only on 100,000 dirhams. Maybe he'll get 10 marks out of 100. May get 50 marks, may get zero marks. For the poor man, we say, bichara hai, poor man. Actually, he's getting 100 out of 100 in zakat. For him, there's no test of wealth. For rich man, there's a test of wealth. You may think, oh, rich man, very good, God has blessed him. It's more difficult for a rich man to go to Jannah than a poor man. That's what a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. We may think it's a blessing. It may be a test. Similarly, on the other hand, the person is poor. For him to do hijab, they stay in one room. For him to do hijab or her to do hijab is difficult. For a rich man who has got a big mansion, many houses, for the lady to do hijab is easy. So there hijab is easier for a rich person difficult for a poor person. So based on the condition, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's easy. There are parents who may be pious. Now they have a child who has a congenital heart disease. Maybe God is testing the parents more. Now the parents may say, oh, I've been praying five times a day. Why do I have a son who has a heart disease? God is testing them. If really the parents are good, what they will say, Alhamdulillah, at least God gave me a son. So what if he has a congenital disease? Now more difficult the test, higher is the reward. To pass BA is very easy. Graduation in arts, very easy. To pass MBBS is difficult. But the moment you pass MBBS, you get doctor's degree, doctor, DR. More difficult the test, maybe Almighty God wants to put the parents in Jannati Firdos. Almighty God is testing the parents with a son who has a heart disease. Yet if the parents have faith in Allah, it's a test for the parents. Nowhere does the Quran say that if a person is poor, he'll go to hell. It's more easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. Nowhere does the Quran say that if a person has a congenital heart disease, he'll go to hell. We feel, oh, bichara hai. For him, actually, the test is easy. We, with our human logic, start thinking, Poor man, 
so poor. Actually, the poor man to go to Jannah is easier. So Almighty God tests different people in different ways. Depending upon the test, the examination, the correction is lenient or strict. That's the reason the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3, verse 185, that Kullu Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense is on the day of judgment. So based on the test, the final judgment is on the day of judgment. Some reward you'll get in this world, some reward you'll get in the hereafter. Whenever there's any calamity, any calamity, it can either be a punishment or a test. If you're on the straight path, that calamity is a test for you. If you're on the wrong path, it's a punishment for you. Similarly, when you get something good in your life, it can either be a reward or a test. If you're on the straight path, that good thing is a reward for you. Or it may be a test for you. Wealth is not always a reward. It is more of a test for you. God is testing you that with this wealth, do you spend it in the way of Allah or not? So based on this, Almighty God tests different people in different ways. Some people are born rich, some in a poor family, some people are born healthy, some people are born congenital defect. Depends upon the test. He tests everyone in different ways and the final judgment is on the day of judgment. Based on that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the human beings in hell or heaven. Hope that answers the question. Uh, in addition, sir, uh, to the same question, I have another. Uh, based upon your answers only, I have uh, one more doubt. Can I question that? Go ahead. All right. Uh, sir, you said that uh, Allah is going to test everybody and like that. But why Allah is doing that? I mean, why God or Allah is doing that? Uh, why, why He created us and for His joy or for, I mean, watching us from uh, up, I mean, up there and uh, Very I mean, good question. why we all, all have been created? Brother, as a question, why has He created us human being? Is He testing us? Is He enjoying using us like puppet? Very good question. That's answered in the Quran. All the other mountains, trees, they are Muslims, they have submitted their will to God. Human being is the best creation of Almighty God. The best creation, why? Because He has given us a free will. He has given human being a free will either to obey or disobey God. All the other creations, the animals, the birds, the trees, the mountains, they are Muslims. Muslims means they have submitted their will to God. Now Almighty God created a new creation which has a free will. The angels have got no free will. They always obey God. Now, after a free will has been given to you, you have a choice to obey or disobey God. After a free will has been given to you, and then if you obey God, you become higher than the angels. After a free will has been given to you, and then you disobey God, you become lower. You may become like a Satan. So it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 72, that... Almighty God asks, who wants to undergo the test? If you don't want to undergo the test, just pass. So trees, mountain, all of them said, we fear to undergo the test. The Quran says, the human beings were fools who said, okay, we want to undergo the test. Now when you undergo the test, you can either become superior to the angel or you can become like a Satan. Now, if you don't undergo the test, just pass. So we human beings, all these human beings, are the people who said, okay, fine, we don't want to just pass, we want to get good marks, and we are undergoing the test. This is a new creation of Almighty God. Not that you want to enjoy. He is giving you a chance to get distinction. We were fools who said, okay, fine. So not to enjoy, to give you a chance to get distinction, not just pass. Now it is on you and me, whether we follow the commandment of Almighty God or not, if you do, you'll get distinction. If you don't, you won't get. Hope that answers the question. Wa'akhiru da'wan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Thank you. Jazakam Allah khaira. That is all the time that we do have at the question and session. So may Allah reward you immensely. Adiyah Sheikh, Dr. Zakir Naik, a big thank you. Jazakam Allah khaira.
يعطيك مر السنين